race to win wars and explore the stars have created some of the most fantastic products ever designed, and we use them every day, unaware of their amazing origins. On Wicked Inventions Hot air balloons, a peaceful form of air travel made popular over the water and battlefields of Europe. Synthetic rubber, how an emergency in Allied supplies during World War II led to the tyres we use today. Metal detectors, the treasure-finding device that has been saving lives for decades. We reveal the amazing science and manufacture behind these wicked inventions. No family occasion or country wedding seems complete these days without the Sky Lantern. Love them or loathe them, they are a fun way to mark an occasion. But did you know the balloon's popularity can be traced through its wartime use? These paper balloons were used to signal orders to battle in Chinese troops in the 3rd century AD. The principle of the hot air balloon is very simple physics. A material envelope, the balloon, is filled with a lighter than air gas such as hydrogen or helium or more commonly, hot air, to create lift and therefore carry additional mass. It took a while for the balloons to reach Europe, however. The first use of balloons in warfare was by the French. In the Battle of Fleurus in 1794, a balloon operated by the new Republican French troops was sent aloft to direct artillery and observe the enemy. They were begun as a bit of an entertainment of quirky thing, but very quickly the French saw the advantage of being able to see in, in the distance, and that was the beginning. They were also used to great effect in the First World War, although it was a little dangerous for the operator. Can you imagine being an observer in a wicker basket hanging underneath a balloon at the Battle of the Marne, the Battle of the Somme? You must be ready to leap for your life. These guys were gutsy, but they were vital. In the Second World War, balloons were used to keep enemy aircraft in check. In the Second World War, of course, you have them as the barrage balloons to prevent planes coming too low to do their damage above important sites. The introduction of the hot air balloon as a, as a military uh, piece of equipment really did open up a new dimension of warfare because it took your observers, first of all, high up into the air. It is a, a massive step forward for the, the military machines of the world. The balloon, truly a wicked invention. Cameroon Balloons Limited have been making hot air balloons since 1971. This was following the construction of the Bristol Bell, which was the first modern hot air balloon in, in Western Europe. Um, started very small in the basement of uh, the house I was living in at the time and uh, gradually grew over the years. They are the biggest manufacturer of hot air balloons in the world. Cameron Balloons sends its balloons all over the world. We send them to Myanmar, where people fly tourists over the, on the temples there. They go to Kenya, where they fly over the wild animals. And um, I think there's, there are very few parts of the world where they haven't flown. There's no such thing as an average hot air balloon, because they're all individual and bespoke but I suppose it takes us between six and 12 weeks uh, to make a balloon, um, sometimes a bit longer if it's a complicated special shape, and we make probably between 90 and 120 balloons a year. The hot air balloon making process starts with actually sitting down and discussing what the person actually wants. Once we've got that established, we can then put it into production. There's quite a lot of design and planning and artwork set up that happens, and then it can go into cutting, where all the fabric and the tapes and all the materials are got together for the fabric part of the balloon. The material that will form the balloon itself is cut into all the different shapes that are required using computer-controlled cutter. Different materials are used in different parts of the balloon. The main ones we use for hot air balloons 
are one called Hyperlast, which is used at the top of, of the balloon. It's a very slippery, strong fabric, very heat resistant. And in the middle section of the balloon, we use a ripstop nylon, which is very light, very strong, and it's even lighter than your normal computer paper at home. And at the bottom of the balloon, um, we use a fabric that's very similar to racing car driver's suits. It's very heat resistant, because of course that's where the radiant heat from the burner is. The different pieces are sorted into sections for easy identification later on. Meanwhile, the burners that supply the hot air to the balloon are built from scratch in the factory. When we use any metalwork in a hot air balloon, we've got that constant battle of having something that's really strong, really reliable, but we want to reduce the weight on it. So these days we can use things like titanium, um, but we tend to use a lot of stainless steel to make it really robust and reliable for our customers. Camera and balloons have developed materials over time to suit the robust needs of a hot air balloon. Making a hot air balloon last is one of our big problems. The fabrics have to be chosen very carefully. Uh, we do extensive testing of fabrics to check on the durability. Materials are constantly tested along the production process to ensure they meet with quality and safety standards, as well as ensuring the balloon is going to last a long time. We check the effect of ultraviolet light on the fabrics, we check the effect of heat, we do tensile tests, and um, we have different weights of fabric for different balloons. The material pieces are then sewn together, incorporating the load straps that form the structure of the balloon and bear the weight of the basket, burners and passengers. The overall construction of a hot air balloon is actually quite simple. There's a load ring at the very top of the balloon. From that point, there carries uh, some tapes which come down to a load ring at the burner. So the fabric just holds in the hot air. The load tapes carry the load, and the ring at the top and the ring at the bottom actually help suspend all of that. Despite the development of new alternatives, the passenger carrying baskets are still made from traditional materials. The basket is still woven from willow and cane. In some ways it's surprising that we still use these very old-fashioned methods, but nothing has come along that's better because the woven basket gives a kind of springiness and resilience which cushions the effect of a bumpy landing. The baskets are fitted out with leather-covered padding and trim, depending on what the customer requires. We not only have to apply all the customer's requirements for different colour trim and, and cushions and so on, but this is the place where the passengers and the fuel tanks will be. It has to perform under duress and in fact it has to do drop tests and various crush tests. Once finished, the balloon is thoroughly tested by the team to ensure it is fully functional and safe before delivery to the customer. We continually inspect our work as we go along and then we go to a final test and inspection stage. And this we do all together on every part of the balloon to make sure that we are 100% happy with it so we can hand on heart give it to our customers with full confidence. The Balloon, truly a wicked invention. In our daily lives, we are surrounded by amazing innovations that make our life easier. But there is only one that has been hailed as humanity's greatest invention. And that's the wheel. The wheel's origins may have been lost in time, but the rubber that grips our cars to the road has a distinctly World War II past. Why? Well, it all starts with natural rubber. Rubber comes from the rubber tree, as it is called. It's a tree that originally found in South America. And what you do is you take the tree, you cut the bark, and sap slowly runs out of it. This sap is a milky mixture of water and latex. Latex contains rubber and latex molecules, and what's then done is it's processed with a bit of acid, and the rubber itself can come out. The peoples of South America used it for many things, including waterproof coats, shoes, and balls to play the, their ball games that they're quite famous for in ancient cultures. Natural rubber may be a useful material, but it does have its limits. 
it has only a certain temperature range over which it will work. In cold winters, it will freeze rock solid and become effectively like a rock and not very useful for its elastic properties. When it gets too warm, it will melt, which obviously doesn't work very well if you're trying to use it as a tire in a hot country. In 1839, Charles Goodyear accidentally stumbled on a way to improve natural rubber's versatility, called vulcanization. By adding sulfur and lead to natural rubber and heating it, Vulcanization took the natural rubber fibres and molecules and cross-linked them with one another and meant that the materials would be more durable and wouldn't melt. A property of a compound when it melts is the molecules slide past each other. If it is cross-linked, then the compound hasn't had that ability and retains the stretchiness of rubber over a greater range of temperatures. This new, altered rubber had even greater uses, including tyres. Rubber is used in car tyres because most road surfaces are not uniform. They're not flat, you've got bumps, you've got potholes. Rubber is great because it's flexible, it can conform to whatever it's put on, and this conformity, as well as having pressurised tyres, allows rubber tyres to go over most surfaces. You go over a rock, it'll deform to go around the rock and still grip on the rock, but then as soon as you pass the rock, the tyre will return to its normal shape. So what's happening here is the rubber is in contact and you have a force of friction. The force of friction is directly proportional to the weight of the car or the vehicle on the road. So the world went crazy for rubber tyres. But what is the World War II connection? Well, the limited geographical spread of the world's rubber tree plantations meant that when the Japanese invaded Southeast Asia in 1941, the majority of the world's rubber production was under their rule. With the US entry into the war, their armed forces required vast amounts of rubber to take the fight to the Japanese. With their natural rubber stocks dwindling, synthetic rubber seemed like the only solution. Invented in 1879, this was the first time that synthetic or man-made rubber would be produced on an epic industrial scale. So during World War II, the Japanese started taking over the plantations in Southeast Asia, and that constrained the world's supply of rubber. The US was entering the war and it needed supplies of rubber in order to man the battleships, the destroyers, and everything in parts of the munitions in the war effort. The problem was they had a million tons worth of rubber and were going through it at a rate of about 600,000 tons per year, so a year and a half supply at most. They formed the Rubber Reserve Committee so that all scraps of rubber could be taken in and recycled and manufactured and reused. About three years later, towards the end of the war, they worked out enough factories to produce it, to produce 70,000 tonnes per month instead of 231 tonnes per year. And this obviously greatly increased the ability for the US to help the Allies to fight the war. Synthetic rubber was going to keep the US war machine moving during the dark days of the early 1940s. But what was the chemical alchemy behind this war-winning technology? Synthetic rubber was originally developed by William Tilden in 1879. He worked out that he could take isoprene and polymerize it. Later on, it was discovered that adding sodium to the mixture, you could increase the polymerization and thus produce synthetic rubber quite quickly. From the success of its use in World War II, synthetic rubber never looked back. And today, it is used far more than its natural rubber cousin. Indeed, 70% of all road tires are made from synthetic rubber. So the next time you take a trip in your car or a ride on the bus, just think you are travelling on a material that was developed to win World War II. Synthetic rubber may be a fantastic invention, but the forces acting on car tyres made with this wonder material are even more impressive. To begin, our intrepid tester takes two of his favourite shopping catalogues and begins to interweave their pages. The experiment will work best if you use two soft-backed catalogues and try and sandwich as many pages as you can, although a few pages at a time will still give you a result. Sometime later, and the two weighty tomes have most of their pages resting in between each other. Now then, try pulling them apart. Not so easy, is it? And it is all because of friction. Friction is the force that opposes motion when two surfaces come into contact. Place a sheet of paper on top of another, and it is easy to slide them apart. But when you have hundreds of pages all acting together, then the force is immense, and there is no superglue in sight. So, how much force is needed to prise the two books apart? I think this calls for a build. 
The materials, wood, weights, metal wire, pulleys, clamps, and an assortment of screws. Taking a trestle, our tester constructs a rig, which will allow weights to be suspended from each book, so we can find out how much weight will make the books slip apart. Let's see if we can beat Mother Nature's friction. Gradually, our tester adds the weights. The wires go taut under the strain, but the books refuse to budge. How much weight can the pages take? Well, quite a bit, actually. In the end, our tester is defeated. With just under 70 kilograms, or the average weight of a woman, trying to pull the two books apart, we've had to halt the experiment, as our rig threatens to break under the testing conditions. And our conclusion? It seems you underestimate the power of friction at your peril. The lure of finding buried gold and precious metals draws thousands around the world to the popular hobby of detecting. Detectorists, as they are called today, have found fabulous hordes of golden sword parts or Roman age coins, but these treasures have sat undetected for centuries due to no accurate method of searching being available. All that was to change, however, in 1919 with the construction of a practical metal detector. The science behind this invention consists of two electromagnetic coils. In your metal detector, you're sending an electrical current through the sender coil. The changing of that electrical current creates a changing magnetic field, a magnetic pulse in the detector. This pulse goes uh, into the ground, and where it is uh, picked up by a metal object, the magnetic changing magnetic pulse causes a current to be generated in, in the metal. And that current then generates, uh, in turn, a magnetic response that your metal detector is now picking up through the receiver coil, and that then, in turn, generates a changing current in a metal detector that is used to signal that you have found an object in, in the ground. With such accuracy to hand, it may surprise you to learn that the first use of these devices was not to hunt man-made treasures or precious ore, but to clear the battlefields of France after World War I. By World War II, a Polish inventor had successfully adjusted the design into a lighter, more user-friendly assembly. With the German army in the deserts of North Africa beaten soundly at El Alamein, the Allies were in full pursuit. Closing in on the enemy, the Allies were stopped in their tracks by minefields that stood in their path. But, armed with the Polish mine detector, Allied troops were able to find and dig up the explosives from the ever-shifting sands. Metal detectors today have found their use in many applications. They play their part in the war on terror by scanning passengers for hidden weapons at airports, and were widely used in the recent conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan. Of course, metal detectors aren't just used for security and war. Another interesting use is the local Dallas Aquarium. They have a big penguin tank with a number of penguins where you can watch them swim. And as it would be, people invariably want to throw things into the water. The penguins will ingest these things. So the zoo there will actually take those penguins and line them up and scan their little bodies with the hand scanner to see if anything's in their bellies. And they found quite a few metallic objects the penguins have ingested that might have otherwise killed them if they were not removed quickly. As the technology behind these detectors improves, it's increasingly likely the Earth will give up more of its metal treasures, buried for millennia. Today, one of the leading producers of metal detectors can be found in Texas, Garrett Metal Detectors. Charles Garrett, a keen treasure hunter, began building his prototype metal detector over 50 years ago. There was one night that my mother came in, Eleanor Garrett, and said to my dad, Charles, let's put it on the market or forget it. So at that point, Garrett Metal Detectors begun. Still very much a family-run business today, Garrett has grown into one of the leading metal detector producers in the world. The production process begins with magnetic modeling in computer software. This helps the engineers to monitor the detector's performance and design the style and shape of the all-important detection coil. The plastic casing of the metal detector is then designed using computer-aided design or CAD software. This software allows the engineer to look at the stress patterns of the plastic and therefore produce the most durable, functional and ergonomic design possible. 
the component parts, connecting wires and other elements of the circuit board are then mapped out on a computer. Once this is done, it is then time to put the electrical components onto the circuit board. Firstly, the solder paste is printed onto the circuit board, ready for the board to be moved onto the pick and place machine. The many different components that make up the metal detector's circuit board are picked from a reel by a high-speed pick and place machine and places them onto the board. Using automated processes such as these allows for a combination of extremely high accuracy as well as fast production of the circuit boards. The boards are then placed through a reflow oven in which the solder paste is heated and therefore fuses it to the components and the board, allowing it all to be held in place. Metal detectors uh, have been around for a long time, but their evolution has really paralleled the evolution of uh, electronic circuitry, uh, you know, roll up to the, today where we use the most sophisticated microprocessors and digital signal processing, low cost, low weight, low power components to really put a tremendous amount of uh, processing power in a small package. A key element of any metal detector is of course the search coil. The coil is made by winding copper wire on a plastic bobbin. This winding machine is custom designed and computer controlled so that the number of windings, location of the wires and the tension can be extremely consistent. The coil is then passed on to the coil wiring line. The circuit board, freshly spun magnetic coils and cables are all put into the plastic shell and then secured with heated glue. Now that the cores have been placed into the shell and the wires have been connected, they are all encapsulated in epoxy resin using an automated mixing and dispensing machine. With the search coil complete, the aluminum tubes of the metal detector, which will form its stem and handle, are bent into shape using a computer-controlled bending machine. This bends the metal to exactly the right shape, depending on the model of metal detector being produced. Holes are then punched into the freshly bent metal stems to allow for the relevant plastic casings to be fitted to them. The metal detector is then finished on the final assembly line. The circuit boards are first installed into a programmer that installs the detector software. Once this is complete, the board is calibrated using test objects, such as coins, that spin over the detection coil. This sends signals to the board that allows the operator to calibrate it, as well as signalling that everything is working as it should be. With the board complete, battery contacts and speakers are then fitted into the plastic console casing. The circuit board and the front panel are then added. The casing's label is stuck into place before it is passed down the line to be screwed and secured, batteries added and then branded. A torque wrench is then used to secure the nuts for the connectors. One connector is for the search coil and the other is for the headphones. The freshly powder coated stems are then attached to the console as well as the cuff assembly. The detector is then linked up to its search coil and different metals are again passed over it in order to verify the detector is detecting with the right sensitivity. Final assembly complete and all tests passed, the metal detector is then boxed up and shipped off, ready to discover wicked new treasures. So there you have it, a dash through the hidden history, super science and amazing manufacture of products that you use every day but have never realised their amazing background. Hot air balloons, synthetic rubber and metal detectors. All Wicked Inventions.